The U.S. foreign policy since 2000 has been a subject to stark criticism and debate. While some argue that it has been inconsistent and lacked clear priorities, others point to specific initiatives as evidence of Washington's leadership and engagement on the global stage. However, one thing is certain for the U.S. The business of war is a major part of the economy. U.S. foreign policy has been under the scanner more so in the last 20 years. Washington has played an active part in one war after another. To name some, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Libya, Ukraine and more recently, Gaza. The list is long, so is the list of unexpected fallouts from these military campaigns. To begin with, the Taliban returned to power after 20 years of U.S. occupation of Afghanistan after a rather embarrassed departure. That is, post Saddam, Iraq became dependent on Iran. Syria's president Bashar al-Assad stayed in power despite a CIA effort to overthrow him. Libya fell into a protracted civil war after a U.S.-led NATO mission overthrew Gaddafi. Ukraine was bludgeoned on the battlefield by Russia in 2023. After the U.S. secretly scuttled a peace agreement between Moscow and Kiev in 2022. And U.S. now visibly stands globally isolated in its support of Israel's onslaught against the Palestinians. Quite interestingly, the U.S. has only been at peace for 17 years of its 246-year history. The business of war is a significant part of the U.S. economy, with military spending as one of the largest government expenditures. The U.S. defense sector income since 2000 has been significant, with annual defense spending averaging around $600 billion. This spending is utilized to fund various military programs and activities, including research and procurement and operations as well. Well, according to a Department of Defense report, in 2022, the DoD purchased a weaponry worth $44.5 billion from Lockheed Martin, $25.4 billion from Raytheon, and they also purchased weaponry worth $21.5 billion from General Dynamics Corporation. It is important to note here that all of them are American defense manufacturers. But the question being, how does the U.S. earn from wars? Well, when war breaks out, military contractors can expect a rise in sales. Case in point, the ongoing Russia-Ukraine war. Ever since Russia's invasion of Ukraine in 2022, the U.S. has provided Ukraine with $44.2 billion in military assistance. Military contractors benefit from this arrangement as the U.S. buys the military equipment from these institutions and sends the weaponry to Ukraine. For example, in September 2022, the DoD worked quickly to replace $1.2 billion in contracts to renew U.S. military stocks for weapons sent to Ukraine. The breakdown includes about $352 million in funding for replacement Javelin missiles. Not only that, $624 million for Stinger missiles and $33 million for replacement of HIMARS systems. The Javelin missiles are manufactured exclusively by Javelin Joint Venture, a partnership between Raytheon and Lockheed Martin. Now, wars are a treasure chest for military contractors whose revenue increases as the U.S. turns to them to renew their stocks. And it so turns out that the U.S. defense contractors have been the biggest beneficiary of these conflicts. The case is of no different in the ongoing Israel-Hamas war. But the U.S. war machine is not only making money from the ongoing Ukraine and Israel wars, it is also involved in more conflicts. These include the ongoing conflicts in Afghanistan, Iraq and Syria. Washington is also involved in wars in North Korea and Yemen. And for more insights on this, we're now being joined by Jeffrey D. Sachs. He is the president of the UN Sustainable Solutions Network and director of the Center for Sustainable Department at Columbia University. Thank you so much for taking our time and joining us here on We On, Mr. Sachs. 
I want to first start by asking you about the roles of American defense manufacturers and what kind of influence do they have on the United States' internal politics and foreign policies? Basically, uh, the uh, military-industrial complex runs American foreign policy. Uh, the idea of American foreign policy uh, is to have a political, uh, financial, and military dominance over as much of the world uh, as is possible. Uh, and this goes back to uh, the end of World War II, uh, when uh, Britain, uh, uh, the British Empire ended and the American Empire, it, in effect, began. Uh, I think the baton was passed to the American Empire, uh, and in 1947, a key year for uh, India, for uh, other parts of the world, uh, that was also the year that the CIA was established and the National Security Act. And the U.S. foreign policy became a foreign policy of manipulation of other governments and the placement of military bases in uh, foreign countries all over the world. So today, the budget of the military industrial complex is somewhere between a trillion and a trillion and a half dollars a year. There are around 800 overseas U.S. military bases. Uh, the annual contracts of the major arms producers like uh, uh, Northrop Grumman hmm. or General Dynamics uh, or Raytheon uh, or other, Boeing or others is hundreds of billions of dollars a year. War is big business. America's involved in lots of wars. Uh, and um, foreign policy is not uh, really a, a subject in which the American people are asked their view. Uh, it's uh, dominated by small groups, the White House, the CIA, uh, the State Department, uh, the major arms uh, producers, and the armed services committees of the U.S. Senate and House of Representatives. And I think all of this uh, is uh, extraordinarily detrimental to global stability. But Mrs. Sachs, you speak of how foreign policy is generally dominated by this small group like the White House or the CIA. And my follow-up question is just on that statement you made there. I want to seek your perspective as to what is the role of the administration, which is, like you mentioned, the White House, Pentagon, or State Department on foreign policy? I think it's... Uh probably about a thousand influential people. Uh, I think there are different camps. Uh, of course, the president does have a lot of say, but I don't think we should regard this uh, as only the president. Uh, there are various interest groups. There's a lot of big money, uh, billions of dollars of lobbying and of campaign contributions uh, each year. Uh, there are uh, factories across uh, America that are in the armaments uh, business. There are lobbies uh, like the Israel lobby, uh, which uh, very effectively tap in to all of this. There are ideologues, of course, as well. So part of it is driven by ideas. Uh, but even those ideas, when you look at the uh, think tanks uh, in Washington, for example, they're generally funded by large uh, military uh, producers. Uh, they're funded by the U.S. government. Uh, they are, in other words, part of the system. Uh, another name for this system of the military industrial complex is the blob. Uh, so the blob uh, it precisely means that, uh, it, oh, it's an interconnected whole if you uh, remember where your bread is buttered, uh, you, you tend to see a, a kind of a interconnected whole and it moves like a blob. Talking about the U.S. economy, Mr. Sachs, how much has the U.S.'s business of war contributed to its economy in the last decade, particularly after the beginning of the Ukraine war in 2022? There is an idea which is wrong that uh, this military spending is a kind of stimulus uh, to the economy. Uh, it's called sometimes the military Keynesianism, uh, named after uh, 
John Maynard Keynes. But I think this is completely wrong because you could spend uh, public funds on all sorts of things and stimulate the economy. But when we spend it on war, uh, we get nothing out of it uh, of, uh, out of value. Uh, it leads to destruction. Uh, it doesn't produce uh, goods and services that uh, help the American people. Uh, so I think it's a waste of money uh, of hundreds of billions of dollars a year. And the wars themselves are very costly. So since 2001, uh, we've been uh, in the wars in Afghanistan, in Iraq, uh, in Syria, in Libya, Yemen, Ukraine, and I'm sure other places as well. And studies that have been uh, done, for example, at Brown University show that this is uh, many trillions of dollars. Uh, what you count depends, but the just the wounded Americans, uh, disabled Americans, the veterans, uh, the health bills are horrendous, not to mention the human tragedy uh, of uh, all of this. Uh, so it's trillions of dollars. Uh, our government never says to the American people, this is so important that you need to pay more taxes. So all of this is uh, funded uh, by borrowing. Uh, this means that the debt of uh, the federal government in the yeah. United States has soared. It's well over 100% of the gross domestic product now, up from about 35% of the GDP in the year 2000. So we've added a massive amount of debt on the mm. books. If uh, the leaders said, look, uh, Ukraine war is very important and we're going to add to your taxes, they'd mm. be run out of town <laughs> immediately. So this is uh, debt financed. And uh, I think it, it's a, been a miserable uh, deal for the U.S. It also diverts attention from so many social needs. Uh, and it also means that we spend so much on uh, technology, but technology for the military. What, what are we getting out of that? Right, Mr. Sachs, you speak of how these wars are expensive indeed, and the U.S. economy has to borrow to fund these wars. Um, now, does it mean that it is the U.S. defense contractors who are the biggest and only beneficiaries of the wars? Because at the end of the day, the U.S. taxpayers have to repay the debt which is incurred to fund these wars. My question to you is that how does the U.S. government explain this to the American? It's very interesting. You know, throughout history, wars uh, have been debt financed and governments uh, often get into debt crises afterwards. A very uh, interesting and famous case is that France helped uh, the American Revolution because uh, France's enemy was Britain. Uh, the American revolutionaries were fighting for independence from Britain. So France made major expenditures uh, for the American Revolution, took on a lot of debt, and then in the late 1780s had to pay for the debt. And that's what caused the French Revolution, <laughs> it was the attempt to collect taxes on uh, to pay for debts that had been incurred for the American Revolutionary War. Really interesting and extraordinary. So today, up until now, the American people have not directly paid for this because we've just been funding the debt with more debt. But now interest rates are starting to rise. Uh, actually, they've risen rather significantly uh, in the last couple of years because during the 2010s, the debt was growing, but the interest rate on the debt was extraordinarily low. It was a bit of a puzzle why it was so low. Now it's risen pretty sharply, and I think it's going to stay higher. And so now we have uh, the interest costs of the debt feeding into the deficit in a pretty big way. So now the debt's really growing, and we're in the midst of uh, some public debate uh, about how to fund the government, which is why we keep having these showdowns mm. in Congress. Will the government close down? But what's fascinating is neither party uh, dares to say taxes. So it's all a question of who's going to cut spending and so forth. We haven't faced up a, as a country 
to uh, this issue. There is no resolution of it, but it will lead to a fiscal crisis. But Mr. Sachs, we have been talking about how U.S. Uh, is involved in multiple wars from Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Libya, Ukraine, and more recently, the Gaza war. The question being that have the U.S.'s military campaigns through the last 20 odd years constantly failed to bear the desired outcome? It doesn't. Uh, we live in a, uh, a web of lies uh, and obfuscations. So, and a uh, very short attention span. Uh, we went to war in Iraq uh, in uh, 2003, ostensibly to uh, uh, end Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction. Uh, you know, if you had a, a modest amount of talent listening to US government propaganda in the lead up to that war, you could pretty much know that uh, th it's, it's baloney. Uh, and uh, yet, oh, it was taken very seriously because Colin Powell went to uh, the United Nations Security Council and talked about the threat to the peace of these weapons of mass destruction, which didn't exist. Disastrous war, very costly, horrible for American foreign policy till this very day, uh, destabilizing the region. Never, it, nobody ever talks about it again in officialdom uh, because the American people are just supposed to go along. Uh, and the same reporters, uh, these miserable, ignorant reporters, as far as I'm concerned, that uh, propounded the war in 2003, oh, they propounded every war since then. And they're so gung-ho on Ukraine and they're so gung-ho on Gaza. Now they want to attack Iran. Uh, it's the same ones. If we had a checklist, uh, you'd see, uh, you know, we're, we play American baseball, of course, so we have a batting average. I don't know how it would be in cricket or uh, other uh, scores. But these guys have almost a zero batting average, and yet they stay as the main columnists in the American media. My last question to Mr. Sachs. According to figures, the U.S. has only been at peace for 17 years of its 246-year history. What does this even reveal about U.S.'s policies in the past and going forward? My guess is that the most violent countries in the world in the last two centuries were Britain and the United States. Uh, Britain invaded everywhere. Uh, Britain uh, had uh, the global empire. Uh, Britain taught America all the tricks of the trade. Uh, and then Britain handed over uh, the imperial uh, baton to the United States uh, at the end of World War II, because Britain went bankrupt uh, after two world wars uh, and uh, also lost legitimacy by all of that, uh, and the United States took over. What is it in this psyche uh, that uh, is leading to all of this? I think there are two theories. One is that, well, any, any powerful country behaves like a hegemon. That's one theory uh, that's uh, called realism in uh, international relations. Another is to look more specifically at the cultural ideology which in Britain and the United States is a kind of evangelical Protestantism. And the evangelical Protestant, Protestantism says, we are the civilization to save the world. Uh, and uh, I think it's a bit of both. Powerful countries maybe tend to behave like bullies, but there's definitely a, a deep ideological view uh, uh, France has its grandeur, but uh, America uh, and uh, Britain have their <coughs> British evangelicalism, uh, their crusader uh, spirit, um, and it's extraordinarily destructive. It's incredibly arrogant, uh, pretty much ignorant of the history of other countries, and rather cruel. Uh, and I think it is built into the ideology. I wrote a book uh, called A New Foreign Policy Beyond American Exceptionalism, where I talked about this ideological point. Uh, when I discussed this with the realists, mm -hmm. like John Mearsheimer, who's a, a good friend of mine, and I like him very much, I want to emphasize, uh, 
you know, he says, oh, big powers behave this way. This is just the struggle for survival. But I think China's different, for example. I personally uh, think that in China's 2,000 years of statecraft, uh, they never really wanted overseas empires, for example. Uh, it's been much more, well, we're, we're the uh, maybe, uh, um, so, you know, the, the center of things, uh, but we don't have to go invade uh, across the world. We'll see if there is that difference. Uh, but I think that American ideology and in this deep way, actually a religious ideology plays a role. Uh, you see even this horrible religious ideology uh, at work in Israel's war on Gaza right mm. now, because uh, there's a lot of biblical narrative in it. Mm. So there is a, not just security or something else. There's a, a real uh, fundamentalist narrative that is quite dangerous. Right. Thank you so much, Mr. Sachs, for taking our time and joining us here on Beyond Sharing Insights with us. Thanks very much.